Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Ana Trujillo Limon, and today I'm joined by my other host, Jamie Hopkins. Jamie, welcome to the show. Hi, Ana. Thanks for welcoming me. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Thanks for being here. <laughs> And today we're joined by Mary Kay Gulick and Dr. Julie Regitz, and we're here to talk research on women in financial services. So thank you both for joining us, making some time. Thank you for having us. Happy to be here. We've already done a few episodes with you, so we know your favorite foods and your first money memories, but are there any updates you want to let our listeners know about? (laughs) Food and money memory updates? Um, There's always a food update, right? So Trader Joe's sells these cashews that are chili lime Thai cashews, and they are the greatest thing that has ever been put on the earth. I probably eat a handful of them every day. They're magnificent. So that's an endorsement for those. (laughs) Yeah, Trader Joe's to sponsor this episode, maybe. (laughs) Did they make it on your uh, food spreadsheet for the holidays? So I didn't cook on Thanksgiving, so I didn't have a spreadsheet, and I still feel pretty upset about it. But but Christmas. Yeah. No spreadsheet yet. I'm behind. But will they make it? No. You don't serve cashews Those are just for her. Those are her special things. Yeah. (laughs) Those are just for me. Is I don't that like share. a rule about cashews and Christmas? I, no, I, it's just I don't do snacky food. But like a lot of people put out like balls yeah, of nuts finger. and finger things they can snack on while they're waiting. Yeah, I put out other things that are nicer and fancier. I, than you just you had snacks out when I went to your house last time. That was a dog party. Brother. That was like we're dog not talking party. about Thanksgiving. You just picked a different <laughs> holiday. All right, I'm out. <laughs> okay. All right, Jamie. Let Dr. Julie talk. Fine, I will go back to being quiet. I have no updates. No updates. Part part of my thing is I only eat the same thing day Uh, after day, year after year, so I have no changes. It's a whole food. Get your thing. Yep, you got it. You got it. Yes, yes. Not your first rodeo with me. So I've been in Seattle and I did not rent a car, so I'm a little bit, I'm, you know, been been very flummoxed to be away from my favorite snacks. So it's very sad. I too am a creature of habit, so I love it. I I love that about you. So we're going to launch right into it then. Um, So. You know, the state of women in financial services is somewhat like Paul Rudd. So Mary Kate, tell us why. (laughs) You know, neither of them has changed a whole lot over the last 20 years. You know, that um, the the overall landscape of it is largely similar to what it was in the early 2000s and really even before that in the 90s. Our numbers are generally the same. Our presence in leadership has improved somewhat, but not significantly. Not what you would expect over Mm -hmm. 20 to 25 years. So I think... For both of us, for both Julie and I, that I, I wouldn't say it was terribly surprising, but it was a little bit like, oh, I thought we were going to see a little bit, a little bit more, mm-hmm. and and we didn't. So it was a it was a hair disheartening. Yeah, I I mean I I didn't expect I'd see any change, so mm-hmm. I think it was <laughs> um, not a lot of surprise then. No, <laughs> no. and um, I think it's worth I think it's worth pausing on that. Um, and, and it is disheartening. It wasn't surprising. And frankly, it's actually really troubling. Mm-hmm. Because part of what that indicates to me is that what we've been doing as an industry isn't working. Mm-hmm. And I think you could actually, and I know this podcast is about women in financial services, but I think you could say the same thing about our diversity members, Absolutely. which haven't improved much either. So for me, it becomes a call out around, wow. Because I, I think there has been activity. Mm-hmm. And I think there's been meetings, and I think there's been task force, and I think there's been organizations, and I wonder if we have confused activity with outcomes. And that's something that I think is really disturbing. And I would even go so far as to say that there hasn't been activity, there's been meetings. And that's what there, yep. that's what there has been. There's been a great deal of conversation, and conversation's a wonderful thing. Conversation is an action. And that, I mean, that's one of the reasons that we did this is because nobody really knows what actions to take and they're afraid to get it wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and there hasn't been a ton of work specifically around identifying what the actual problem is because the underrepresentation of women isn't the problem. It's a symptom. It's yeah. the primary symptom of other problems. And if we only talk about what that symptom is, then there's nothing to fix. Yeah. So the, the real goal was to start identifying some of those barriers so we could talk about what actions would be efficacious. Yeah, so uh, two questions from that, and that's for everybody, Jamie included. Uh, Why was it important to Carson to first do this research? And second, what are some of those key barriers that the research identified, even though people probably know since they're similar, like Paul Rudd, um, and they haven't changed, but what were some of those? So the two questions. And whoever wants to go first can 
I'll Jump go right first because I'm a difficult person. But I mean, we did it because, <laughs> I mean, if you if you look at the the way that wealth is going to move in the next, and I, I used to say in the next 30 years, it's the next 10 years now, it's the next seven years, really, $30 trillion of wealth will be moving into the hands of women between the ages of, you know, 45 and 70. That's a boatload of money. And 70% of women would rather work with a female advisor. Everybody knows this, that when you know, if, if it's a married couple and the husband dies or there's a divorce, usually the wife bails on the, the family advisor and finds her own. So it's a significant amount of money to leave on the table if you don't have women in those positions who are ready to take those clients. So, I mean, that's just the economic argument. Um, and so the reason we're doing the research now is because we want to identify those actions every year. And this is very much not about it's not about Carson. We just like doing things instead of talking about things. This is about all of us. This is about the industry as a whole. And that's why we work really hard to bring partners into this so that it's um, so that it's something that we share that we're all bought into because certainly one company cannot cannot do everything. I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. On why it's important. Yep. Why we decided to do it. Yeah. yeah I well, I can add a parts of why we decided on it. And I think to kind of picking up off of Mary Kate's last point is that we did not look at the represent and research as a solo project, which I think is super important because going back to the activities and meetings and outcomes kind of conversation is, and I've been pretty vocal about this for a while is I, I think every organization has their own initiatives and they don't tend to like move outcomes very much. So and it's this almost like we are supposed to do it, so we do it, versus like how do we actually change something. So if you look like the, uh, what is uh, American uh, Heart Associations right there, if you thought about like Heart Association, I know it's not a perfect analogy or example, and every company decided that hearts are important because it keeps us alive. And we all ran our own like heart impact like missions we would not have a very big impact we'd have like we'd, we'd all have like one story of one person we helped with like a heart issue versus where in some areas of the nonprofit world groups have come together and actually centralized all of that and then like everybody kind of gets like yeah if it's heart stuff you should probably work with them or suicide prevention right and you can go through a bunch of organizations and in our profession it's even at the professional organizational level they don't communicate well. They don't work together cross-functional. So I think anything that should be done in this space has to be cross-company, cross-initiatives. It can't just be these solo projects, or it really won't have a huge impact. You might be able to impact a couple people, but not a lot. And so that's, I think, one step of this was doing that. And then we're, I know we're going to try to take that further and incorporate more partners. And even you know, CFP board and Julie met yesterday and talked about uh, you know kind of pulling some of that research together with them and there does have to be eventually a hub of that that pulls people together yeah I feel like that's one area you're really right that we can learn from nonprofits is the collective impact process yeah. the ones who are doing it really well understand the value of a backbone organization that supports the whole collaboration mm -hmm. because it's freaking challenging yeah. for multiple organizations to to collaborate and nobody likes to pay for that coordination, administrative function, yeah. and research is, is a core part of that. Yeah, and that doesn't mean there, there aren't local versions of it. So, like, ALS is actually a very good mm -hmm. one, right? Like, they have a national, and they've got local, and they coordinate those initiatives, and you can donate to the one, and then they help them do that. And, you know, they're not the only one that operates like that, but we don't have that centralization in financial services at all. Like, the, the nonprofits that are here do not coordinate well together. The trade associations do not coordinate together. They're all their own kingdoms and fiefdoms, and that is how it operates today. Yeah, I think, and I completely endorse everything these guys said. Um, that's the reason. That that's the right reason. Um, I would add maybe one thing, which is that you know pain pushes and vision pulls. Mm -hmm. And where we are right now as this industry is not in pain yet. Um, Mary Kate is absolutely right about the need for female advisors. Jamie's absolutely right about the need for consolidated effort to make changes, but people don't hurt. This isn't hurting firms yet. Um, so we have to have the vision. And for me, this is this is a deeply and impactfully an issue of social justice. There are mechanisms structurally that are operating in our industry that systematically disenfranchise and disempower core members of our population. 
that's wrong. It's just wrong. And um, there has to be people, there are a lot of people who stand up for that and who believe in that, and I'm proud to work for a company that does too. Um, but the amount of change that's going to be required is going to have to happen because we see a vision of a world and an industry that is inclusive and accepting and honoring of difference, and we have to build towards that vision instead of waiting for the pain. Mm -hmm. And so I'm proud that we're on the front edge of that, trying to create a co-create a vision with our partners, with our sponsors, knowing we can't do it alone. But of what and what motivates me is, yeah, I maybe have 15, 20 years left in this business. I would like to see it better when I leave. Mm -hmm. um, with women having a different experience than maybe I did or other people did. I love that. Oh, thanks. So the barriers identified in the study, Dr. Dill, you said that these are not keeping women from coming into the profession, but they're keep, they're preventing them from staying in the mm -hmm. profession. So can you speak to that a little bit more? I think our schools do a really good job of of bringing of bringing students into this industry. And of course, I'm just talking about one path, one glide path, but it's becoming more and more important, which is the existence of these CF programs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, actually right now, Carson, or, you know, me and a couple of our partners at the program director level are trying to get some statistics on that. Um, but I can tell you impressionistically and anecdotally, um, about half the students in undergraduate programs are female. Mm -hmm. So what's happening? Something's happening, right? Because we're graduating students of you know fairly representative students, um, and yet they're not finding you know we're, we're not seeing that trickle into the numbers yet. And maybe we will. Maybe it's a little early. So so so, so the firms are doing something, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of it has to do. And I'd be interested in what these folks think. I almost view it as a mindset. One of the, I was talking to someone the other day about Carson's advisor development program, and I say we don't view tests like the 65 as a weed out mechanism. That's not who we are. That's not what we're about. We view this as an obstacle that we're going to partner with you to overcome. Mm -hmm. And so when we hire you, we make a commitment to invest in you and in your development. And that's, not, of course, not endless, right? And you make a commitment to invest in us, and it's a partnership. And I think it's that level of investment, that level, we're just going to hire a bunch of folks, and the ones who pass their 65 or their 7, like we're going to keep those, and, you know, the other ones, well, they washed out because they weren't good enough or they couldn't make it or they just failed the test. Mm -hmm. It's that orientation of bringing in, a, bringing in people and investing them that I think is really going to make the difference and hopefully they'll stay. I think that's a, a really good way to good way to put it but as we were looking at the barriers we gave them kind of multiple choice uh, mm -hmm. all of the survey respondents to what their primary barriers were and they're what you would have expected you know the first one that they picked is you know balancing family obligations with work and that they value flexibility um, finding a mentor was the second one things like that but I think the thing there was the unasked question there because we constrained it to multiple choice so anybody who picked other 47% of them just were like garden variety sexism that is the problem and then another 23% on top of that, they, they just phrased it somewhat differently. They talked about these informal networking opportunities that are not available to them. Um, some of them called it the old boys network. Some of them just called like, I don't golf. And you know, these guys still go to the strip club for meetings. And that's one of the things that they considered an obstacle. And I kind of lumped those two together. We didn't ask that question, but they really wanted to make sure that that's the answer that we had. So that was, Again, probably not surprising to Julie because she's the realist among us. Um, but to bad, me, I was like, bad. what? Um, but you're right. It's getting them into the business isn't the challenge. We really focus a lot of effort on recruitment, um, which we need to do because it's not just about women there. It's nope. we're not getting enough anybody into the oh. profession. Um, it's the keeping. It's the culture of the profession that's like, you know what, this is not serving my life well because I can't do the other things in my life that I need to do in a way that is meaningful. Um, and I don't like being in these situations and being treated this way. So there's, there's a lot of improvement we can do. And one of the things that we were talking about was advancement, that there's so not typically those glide paths from, you know, associate planner or even operations professional into a leadership role or an advisor role. Last night at dinner, I met the most incredible woman. Her, uh, she owns a firm in Vancouver, Washington, and it's a multi-planner firm. She's got, I think, you know, 26 or 30 employees. Every one of them has a glide path and development plan into where they want to go. Every one of them. And 
if a company that size can do it, there's really no excuse for the larger organizations to do it, and there's no excuse for the smaller offices not to do it. The larger ones have more resources, the smaller ones have fewer people to deal with, but I mean, she's made that core to her way of hiring and retaining people, and her retention is stellar. They don't have a turnover problem. It's it's remarkable. I could have sat there and listened to her talk about it forever. Is that Heidi? It is. Yeah. She's got it right. And I was talking to one of her advisors as she recruited. Like she wasn't even an advisor. She was like a um, on a counselor, and and the way that she was just talking so highly of her and her how she came into the profession, how she was recruited. So sorry, Damon. Go ahead. I think you were going to say something. No, it's just yeah. She's uh, run an amazing business and cares about the profession and development of people and even just development of the profession too, right? I mean, it's not just her office she cares about, but she shared that, right? She's been in leadership roles with FPA at the local level. And, you know, it's amazing to see that uh, kind of give back of time. And, you know, yeah, she's built a big firm, but it probably could have been bigger if all she focused on was her firm and not giving back too. The uh, I'll give a story. I don't know if anyone. I, I have got to cut some details out of this one, but the like the barrier stuff. Um, my very first in meeting back after COVID. So I don't know, like you. I I don't know if either one of you were with the firm then. You might have been on a right. Were you? When did you join? Join Carson. Yeah. Um, in June of two thousand and twenty-one. Okay. Me too. Yeah. So. Uh, my very first meeting back, and it was not a Carson meeting. I got invited to go to some meeting, and I went. And I don't know the number, but it was like something like maybe 25 people were there. And uh, it was all male. Every single person that showed up there was a male. I was the youngest person there, which now I'm not really the youngest person out there, right? Like we've talked about this a couple times lately. <laughs> and uh, probably the first 20 minutes were like, old school jokes about strip club stuff that they all used to go to together and i just remember sitting there being like i don't miss in-person meetings at all like <laughs> it was just like like wait this is what was it always like this and i was like and i was just looking around being like this can't it's like, i must have forgotten something but it was just like and that was weird because to me we had that break from that type of environment and honestly it probably was like that most of the times before but i had had such a break from it that when I walked back into that first one, it was like, this thing sucks. Like, I don't want to be here and I feel awkward here. And I don't like any of that stuff. And like, yeah, it just, it felt really weird to be back into that. And, you know, as you said, like that might've not been like overtly people chose not to invite people. Some people might've been invited and looked at the list of people and been like, I'm probably not going, right? So there are barriers and just structures that occur like that. And I worry, I worry more, as you say, Julie said, keeping people, I worry more when I look around at like the promotion level aspects of things in this industry to like Heidi, uh, a standpoint, like there aren't, we don't have a lot of billion dollar female RIA owned and led firms or even um, practices inside of larger firms where they're female led at the large scale. And some of those are actually production driven but then you look at a lot of boards and things like that. We lack a lot of, you know, just representation of people there. And so I think that's built into the system. I don't think it's always purposeful, but it comes out, right? And I think part of that is what do we expect from people and leadership styles of a group that's already there? They, they think that leaders should be how they are, maybe not a different version of that. And like that's something I've heard before. And I've shared that with, you know, I think everybody here that I've heard, oh, this is like, here's the next group of leaders out there. And you're like, well, those are all just people like you, right? You don't think of different styles as other effective ways to lead. When you, sorry, no, I think it goes to, as you guys were talking, I was thinking about at Carson, if you come to interview for my advisor development program, you only meet with women. And you interview with me, usually before, and I'm a vice president. You interview with Erin Wood, who leads our wealth solutions team, and she's a senior vice president. You interview with the head of operations at Carson Wealth, who's a vice president. And um, you, once in a while, I think you used to meet with, like, one of the planners on Erin's team who was a guy, but it clearly was the person who reported to Erin, and that was very clear. And it's been really – and now you would meet with a woman who directs financial planning. Um, and for me, that's really impactful because I think, to Jamie's point, 
you know, when you have women in senior positions, you have women who are in those rooms based on their title, and that changes the dynamic of the conversation. And every woman I've hired and interviewed has commented that they came to Carson because of that. You know, because they only, and they, and they like that, right? They either were very different women and um, very different styles, very different ways of kind of presenting ourselves, but usually they can find one. And it's usually not me, right? It's usually Erin or Joanna where they're like, wow, you're something I want to be. You're someone I want to be. I want to emulate my career off that. You look really smart, you look really capable. And for me, it doesn't, it doesn't matter who it is. It just matters that they see it. And I would just add one more point. It also matters for the men I hire. Because you're going to report to a woman, you're going to mainly interact with teams that are led by women. And I think that's a good thing for men to see too. And, and a couple of them have commented on it as well. Like, are there any guys in leadership? I'm like, well, Jamie's here, but he's not around. Much, right? but, <laughs> but, you know, yes, of course there are. But at the same time, they look around and they see it. And I think that was something that came through in our study as well. Seeing people in positions of authority, having that person, if I could be an Aaron Wood, I could be a Mary Kate, mm -hmm. I could be a Joanna Swanson. Um, that really, really matters. And I think the firms that, that get that um, will be the ones that kind of win in the retention battle in the end. If you can't see it, you can't be it. Well, if you can't see it, you also can't, don't believe it exists. You know, and that's another part of it too, right? You talk about promoting women, but where are they? And I'm like, well, if you want to come to where I work, I can tell you where they are. You don't have to look far, which is really cool. It is I'm cool. proud of that too. I'm sorry, you were no, going to say. Um, so in, in the research, I know it didn't break it up by, you know, ethnicity and things like that. But as far as women of color are concerned, being a woman of color in this profession, we didn't talk a lot about that. So, like, I'm curious because I don't see a lot of me places. And what your perspective, since it wasn't in the research, I, I'm curious about all three of your perspectives on that and including women of color's perspective in this in the future. I like the idea of breaking it down further. I think mm -hmm. one of the things is you keep it simple and binary, then you can you can test out yeah. the appetite for it. Um, but that is the desire. But I mean, look at the sample. It's pretty darn representative of the industry, which means it's a super white group. Yeah. Um, so in order to break that down, we need a higher N on any non-white group. Um, in order to get anything meaningful. So that's going to have to be an intentional part mm -hmm. of sample development going forward. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're talking about the idea of getting a research partner who can do that a lot more effectively mm -hmm. than we can do on our own. But now that we know, we can, we can really make this work and we can get meaningful results and identify meaningful barriers and, you know, ideate efficacious actions off of those. Mm -hmm. Now we can do it. Um, we just need somebody to help us do it who can do it a lot better. You're absolutely right. It's a huge miss. Um, I remember I was talking to Jamie once about something. I can't remember what it was, but we were talking about putting a group of people on stage, and he was listing off a, you know, some really, you know, essentially a bunch of white guys. He was the youngest one. And I said, well, you could put me on that stage, and that doesn't really improve much. It does a little bit, but let's be honest. I'm a 46-year-old affluent white woman. My, what what's going to move the needle for me, it, it, you know, a white, a, white, a white cisgender straight woman, right? Like, I, my, what's going to help me, what's going to support me, my development does not take into account the intersectionality we need to explore in this mm -hmm. business. Um, I don't face layers of discrimination, mm -hmm. largely because of my race, my gender, and my socioeconomic class. And I don't think we can underestimate the importance of socioeconomic um, the soft skills that you learn that are so important in this business, so important to develop relationships, came to me for no entitlement of my own, for, for no, I didn't earn any of that. I was just born into it. So I think Mary Kate's absolutely right. We need a bigger sample. We need a better sample. Um, I think we're going to get that next time. But the solutions, there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution to encourage more women of color to come into this industry, to encourage more women who come from rural backgrounds from less affluent backgrounds is going to require a deliberate figuring out of what are their obstacles um, in, in, in how do we as a, as you know a thought producing organization inform other organizations about how to how, how to speak to their needs specifically and I think one of the important things to continue emphasizing is it 
and I, I said this a lot, but it's not just about bringing women and women of color into the industry. It's about making the industry worthy of the ones that we have. Agree. And and that's that's where the work begins. Yep. Beautiful. Yep. Uh, a lot of thoughts, but I don't know which ones I want to say out loud right now. I think there be a whole podcast on the like, things Jamie didn't say out loud in the other podcast. They're good also, <laughs> things not to say out loud sometimes. Well, I think one of them, it's kind of tied to this, is, you know, I, I worry about the, like, failing of people when they're given opportunities to, meaning that, like, the expectations are different than the stated ones. Um, yes. And th yes. that is a big challenge. I think that's one of the issues on keeping people, right? That there's kind of yeah there's two there's two sides of that and they're not always clear to people and then we say oh like you failed and you're out and you know it's not always you know that straightforward either right it could just be you didn't execute in this line so now you don't have that path and you have to go find a different way i think the other one to honor your point and you and i have talked about this which is it can be very daunting for the first person that has to go somewhere right mm -hmm. that they're not always sure that they want to be the first and you know that's a personal decision and it's also though for women of color or whoever it might be in leadership roles like unfortunately where we are today is like somebody has to be the first in most companies and if there isn't a first one then the next person says well i don't see anybody but did six people you know get failed by the company or also say i didn't want to be that person and now there's going to be six more until there is somebody that says i am going to be that person and so I think as best as we can do is also support people so they feel like they can be that one. Mm -hmm. And then the next person says, hey, look, like there is somebody here like me. I can be just like them. And whether it's a podcast or whether it's bringing students in or whether it's running marketing, uh, all of you have been a first in something out there that now other people can say, I can be like Julie, I can be like Anna, I can be like a Mary Kay or a Terry Shepard who's the president of a you know, $20 billion RA firm. Well, I don't know there's maybe like two other terries out there right like that's about it um so like to be the first in that is important because you don't have to say there's never been anybody like that there yeah that self-expectation point is really interesting though that's what Brene Brown calls them and it's I mean it's not just an organizational thing that's in relationships too mm -hmm. um Oh, yeah. That, yeah. The, oh, yeah. I have so is. many stealth expectations of you, you know, just constantly every day. I don't tell you any of them. Then you find out I'm just like, oh, it was okay. And you're like, well, what's like, your huh? real expectation? We yeah. did what we said we were going to do, Jamie. Right. And I'm like, yeah, it was all right. I wasn't going to so say any of that. So that's, that's not what I was going to say. You just went and spilled all the beans. Like you've, like, we don't need to do the podcast no. except that Jamie doesn't say. So, great. Yeah, but anyway, what it's I was going to talk about is, and I don't like to go to formalized processes on everything, but the idea of having really clear communication guidelines, like this is what we're doing, don't care how you get there, this is what we need to hit, and then how are we how are we going along the way, not in a kind of babysitting, hand-holding way, yeah. but so everybody's on the same page, um, because not everybody communicates really well. And also not allowing people to move targets then too, right? Like So that's one, like one of my good friends, Chris Gandy, who's, you know, a a leader out there and he's always talked about it. I think this first firm he was in they were like here's your production number if you do that we'll move you up and he'd he'd hit it and they'd be like well yeah but we need we need to see a little bit more and he'd hit it again and hit it again and eventually he left and started his own firm because he's like every time I would do that as a black male it seemed that the post got moved right and I couldn't get there and they would always redefine it and then he's like like I could hit everything and I just had to go out and just do it myself and he's built a great firm and business and i don't know he's got like 30 some people that roll up to him and he's amazing but that i think that happens too um even with like clarity is like can you also hold then the leader accountable for what they set too right so it has to be able to go both ways in that accountability and process i think that i'm, I'm gonna like go on meta here right you know i think one of the challenges we have is is expectations that are so stealth that they're stealth to you and not only like the person that you know is, you're supposed to be directing, but you also don't know the expectations you have. And I think that's where we have to be very purposeful mm -hmm. about looking at our own bias about how people show up. And um, I've listened to folks talk about not ready to be client facing. I'm like, oh boy, is there so much loaded in that statement? Not ready to be client facing, or has a way to go to be client facing. 
Um, and there's a lot in that. And what's interesting is, uh, you know, none of this comes from bad intentions, but let's unpack what that means. Um, let's unpack is that, you know, is there, w what are your concerns, right? And th that, that's where you see the, the, the super stealth stealth expectations, right? That my expectation is that you're going to show up in a certain way and you're going to look a certain way and you're going to smell a certain way and you're going to dress a certain way and your shoes are going to be the right way. Smell matters. Um, that you're going to have like a world in which you match my expectations of what you should look like, but I'm not going to tell you what those are, and you probably haven't had them modeled to you. And I think there's, you know, a lot of, and so you have the thing like what happened to your friend, which is then the problem was never his production. The problem was something else that he wasn't doing that was unarticulated and maybe even un, unthought of in a formal way in whoever was managing his head, right? And, and I think that's where we really have to challenge. Well, why do I think an advisor is going to look like that? I, you know, what is it about their behavior that's going to have them not, you know, be able to empathize and relate and offer good financial advice? And those are very, very hard conversations to have. And I think that's where I get very realistic about them because they're deeply uncomfortable conversations mm -hmm. and no one is going to sign up for that. That's why I tend to lean more on enforceable processes, um, which is not everybody's favorite thing, but human beings are deeply flawed and we can't live in discomfort indefinitely and we won't put ourselves through it unless someone is holding us accountable to do so. So in our, as our time comes to a close together, um, there's one final question I definitely want to make sure we talk about. Dr. Lee, you, you talked about a very powerful story at Excel Represent when you both presented this research. Um, you know, when you went to your boss about a situation and he listened to you. I wonder who that is. I wonder who that guy is. <laughs> <laughs> so, Some stealth expectations there. <laughs> but, but in part of that, the question is really, what role does it do our male allies, our bosses, our sponsors play That's in really this? Important question. And then for Jamie, it is changes a little. What advice do you have to male sponsors, allies, and bosses to, you know, help the women that you are managing and directing to advance? So the question shifts a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so what, we'll start with you, Dr. Julie, and then go to Jamie, and then we'll come to a close. I don't know if it's been by happen chance or luck or something I've done consciously or unconsciously, but I've been very fortunate to work for, for, for men who are true allies. Um, part of that, I think, is that, you know, my current boss is younger. I think that makes a difference. My, my previous boss was African American. I think they had a different perspective, maybe, and a different growth path into this business. But in general, they were just good human persons who cared very much about the values I had about things like social justice, about things like equity and fairness. Um, I can't be who I want to be without male allyship. I can't do the projects I want to do. I can't feel the way I want to feel at work. I can't advocate for the, for the people I lead without effective male allies. Um, they're vital. They're crucial. They're important. Um, I can tell you honestly that I've chosen my last two organizations that I've worked for on the basis of the allyship I anticipated I would get. So I would encourage women out there to make that a priority um, and to think through, you know, we can't do this alone. We need allies in all levels um, and to work to build relationships and maybe even make career choices based on where you are going to find that level of support. One of the things what we asked in the research was you know the barrier question and the second one was can't find a mentor can't find a mentor can't find a mentor and in the survey it was very apparent that we were everyone who was responding was referring to female mentors mm -hmm. in the interviews most of which were with more established female advisors it was incredibly common to see how important their male allies yeah. were in the beginning in of their male careers mentors. yes yeah. um introducing them to the right people helping them feel at home in a social situation that was really pretty foreign to them um, small things like that that don't matter, bringing them into client meetings so that they could see for themselves what a Bridging transformative... Your credibility gap. Yes, right. exactly. But hero. really intentional actions that were just kind of part of the everyday without a formalized program, without, you know, anyone really holding you accountable, just excellent people development mm -hmm. overall. And that that was kind of a make or break experience for their careers. So I think very often when we think about mentorship and when we talk to other young women about mentorship, it's just implicit that we're talking about a female mentor. Mm -hmm. um, and with, you know, the 
the industry being 20% female and 80% male, the numbers don't really work there. That's a lot of mentoring for, you know, female leaders to do. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm a little bit busy. So um, <laughs> go where the numbers with. are. Like the man <laughs> says, love, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with, right? <laughs> so I just think it's something that gets overlooked too often, um, both on the side of, of women and, and on men that they, you know, she wants a female mentor, not me. Not always the case. And we really need both parties to step up to that and embrace that reality yeah. on the mentorship one i will say ask people i mean i think that's the biggest one a lot of people maybe get lucky if you do well we've done a lot of these shows on as i have and a lot of people who are successful in their domain tend to tell us that they had a really good mentor but it's almost like i got really lucky i had a really good mentor but you don't have to get lucky on that you can ask somebody yeah. and you know I don't think enough people ask for mentors, but I was just, when you guys were talking about that, I was thinking, okay, I have three people in my life who, has, who have asked me to be a mentor, but none of them are women, right? Uh, it's, but interestingly enough, it is um, a young black male, an Asian male, and then a white male. So there is something there that they didn't just pick people that look just like them to ask me, but I've never had any woman ask me to be their mentor. Now, other aspects of working with people, sponsors, supporting, yes, but uh, not mentorship, right? And I just think that's interesting, to your point. Like, I probably would say yes to some people if they asked. And uh, I think for my advice on the other side is that, you know, I think in the hiring part is a big thing. Is not always just trying to hire, like, what you think you were which i think a lot of people hire around and it's kind of the other part of the, talking about the leadership like you don't always have to hire like the repl replica of you so like try to find people who actually complement you that are you know have different skill sets and so that might mean that somebody's more emotionally intelligent than you and you're more adaptable right whatever it might be and then you supplement those together and that's actually stronger than just nine people who are really good at one thing and I tend to use the football analogy for that, even though um, I, mean, I could probably pick a different sport. But football is, is easier because you have very defined roles. Like Tom Brady is not meant to be there to tackle. So if you filled the team with like 12 quarterbacks or 11 quarterbacks, right, you wouldn't have a very good team. You'd have a really terrible team. Even if you had 11 Tom <laughs> Brady's, it would be the worst team in the NFL, right? Like it would be awful. Um, even though you had a bunch of super good individual talents, they wouldn't work well together. So you have to find people that are completely different to complement each other. And I think that's in the hiring process too and promotion process and team building process. That you need different people, different skills. If I could just add one thing. I think one of the things that's been really interesting for me to watch is um, I think that, that mentoring women increases men's men's ability to be allies because it increases their empathy and level of awareness i remember talking to my the, a guy i used to work for and i looked at him i said how many loads of laundry do you put away a week and he kind of looked at me and he knew where i was going he's like i put away my own clothes <laughs> <laughs> and i just kind of smiled and i said do you know what i did this morning before i came to work and I went through, and I and not not in a oh gosh, Julie, you're super. I mean, I've made my choices, right? I got four little kids. I, it's crazy, but like, here's what I did this morning. And I said, and then I come to work, and I may have this level of emotional energy. And I think it was just very, particularly for men who maybe have a wife who, who doesn't work outside the home, um, or who isn't in a position where she has, you know, really. I think it creates a level of awareness around your your experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that transparency with my male mentors of being like, did you see that guy look at me like that? And he's like, no, I actually totally didn't notice that. I'm like, well, he did, and it made me feel bad. Mm -hmm. And I think then we, I think our male allies and mentors do get a chance to see the world through our eyes, which just helps them be better. Too. I, I always like to say that behind every successful man is an even more successful woman still doing a majority of the domestic chores. Probably <laughs> probably putting away more than one load of laundry a week exactly. and the clothes that aren't theirs. So the last thing is where can people find the research and the findings? There is a landing page at Carson Group that I will happily send out to put in the show notes. Awesome. So just pop in the Perfect. show notes and you can grab that. Oh, um, and you can you can download the PDF or you can just, there's a very cool interactive way to, to work your way through the statistics. Um, I'm a big believer that 
there's a, there should be a statistic for anything that you want to know. And I think when Julie and I set out, our goal was what are the things that we want to know that don't exist yet? Um, so Love hopefully it. those are things that you also wanted to know. So they're all there. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank all three of you for being with me today and sharing some time and your knowledge. I appreciate you all. Oh, thank you. Thank Anna. you for having us. Thank you for having me. And thank you all uh, for tuning into this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode.